Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 22nd of November 2022. Martin Northrum, Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you on for another property ride. I've got Veronica who will be coming in very shortly, but just before I bring her in, uh, as always, I will just remind you that we are not providing property financial legal advice. It's a general conversation only. We do moderate the stream, encourage you to share your thoughts, but uh, please uh, just be careful what you say. Uh, as out the 22nd of November 2022, if you're watching in replay, and if you'd like to ask a question, then use at Walk the World. That'll make sure you get into my queue and I can then put the question up on the screen and we can deal with it. I've also enabled Super Chat. And if you want to use Super Chat, you can get your question to the top of the list or indeed make a contribution to what we do around here. We do this not to make a profit, but simply because we think this is a really important conversation at this particular time. Right. So let me push this button. Veronica, hello. Hello, how are you? Very good. Good to have you back on again. A few Great months since you. we had the last conversation and, uh, well, the property market's morphed a bit more, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's it just keeps us alive, right? You know, that nothing stays still. Everyone seems to think that the property should stay high, the property market should stay high or stay low or whatever, but it just keeps moving. Keeps us interesting. <laughs> yeah, bobbing and weaving and diving, it's always, it's always good. And uh, what I find interesting is that the... Um, you know, the mainstream media and the uh, the real estate rags are trying to tell part of the story, but actually not really the full story. And so what we're trying to do, I think, do here tonight is to try and peel the onion a bit and come down to some of the real things that are going on. Because, you know, property is, is complex. Property in the current environment is complexer, if there's such a word. Complexer and complexer. And the problem is with headlines, as we all know, they're just wanting to get you to click and sensationalism is what it's all about. There's not really anybody that worried about the nuance, you know. <laughs> so that's what we're all about, Martin, right? The nuance, the granular. <laughs> yeah, the nuance window, right? And that's really important because um, there is not a binary story about property, right, which is universally true in every location at any one point in time or indeed over time. And, and, and that's really the, the trick. So you and I both say you've got to go granular. You've got to really get to understand what's really going on. And frankly, don't be misled by, you know, the property portals and their uh, high level indices or, uh, you know, the other stuff that's out there or even the stuff in the in, in the papers about the top 20 postcodes or the worst 20, you know. It really is not helpful when you're trying to make property decisions. It's always, I laugh about the top 20s and the bottom 20s. There's a suburb in Sydney called Birch Grove. It's a very small suburb. It's on the harbour. It's about three kilometres from the CBD. And um, it has a very diverse um, makeup of property. And it always makes those lists, always. And that's because it is not a homogenous suburb. And it's small, so it's got a very, it's got a insignificant data set, and yet it always makes it. And every time I see a list, I bet Birch Grove's on there, and I have not actually had the, I don't know if I caught the pleasure or the, the displeasure of seeing that Birch Grove has missed the list ever since I've been saying that. <laughs> yep, yep, yeah. It is funny how the same ones pop up. Um, it's a bit like my stress, you know, analysis. There's a, there's a bit of fighting for the top ones, but you know, in the top twenty, you often find the same ones there all the time. And, and there's some movement over time, but not dramatically so. So it just shows you that you've really got to try and get into Understand. It. Yeah, ex exactly right. All right. Well, before we get into some of the questions, give us, give us your sort of two-minute take on, on what you're actually seeing with regard to the property market. And I guess you cover the predominantly Sydney, so we maybe start there, but you know, I'm happy to just broaden the conversation too. Yeah, well, I guess I've got a bit of an unusual sort of portfolio in the sense that Good Deeds Property Buyers is very much Sydney-based. We we deal with a 10K radius of the CBD, so inner west, eastern suburbs and lower north shore. And so that's that's quite a unique market and um, and a very stable market in many respects. And then, of course, through Home Buyer Academy, I've got exposure to people buying all across the country um, and also suburb help to, to a degree. And now I'm actually working with buyers agents, mentoring them, right? So I have exposure to other markets, but in terms of my team, we just buy in the inner Sydney ring. And so what I'm seeing in the inner ring is really interesting because, yes, we look at Sydney um, aggregate property data and, you know, I refer uh, particularly to CoreLogic data because that's, you know, and domain for that matter, but CoreLogic data is 
certainly <clears throat> gets a lot of noise every month. You look at you know, what the Sydney prices have done or haven't done. And in our local patch, I, when the market really starts transitioning from one type of condition to another, I like to start tracking individual property resales. And I never fail to be astounded by how many people might buy a property one year and then sell it the next. Like I, I find that bizarre anyway, but be, despite all that, um, I've currently got, and this is without trying too hard. I haven't gone out asking agents to give me listings. I will at some point, but so just preliminary uh, at this stage, 14 properties that had sold last year that have subsequently sold this year or, or waiting to be sold. So two of them, right, one still yet to be sold. Of the 14, 12 have sold for more than they sold for last year. One sold for less and that property had sold originally October last year and at the time we were like astounded at how ridiculously high it was. So even in a hot market it seemed stupid, like beyond stupid at the time. So there's no surprises there. And the one that's uh, yet to sell, we don't know, potentially could sell for less. But 12 out of those 14 have sold for more. And this is in a market where agents are telling their vendors, you're not going to get what you could have got last year. And it's like, well, actually, you don't have any evidence of that. You know, in terms of I've got evidence that quite a significant proportion of the resales um, have been selling at a game. Now, it might be it's the price was more, so ultimately the owners may have lost money when it comes into transaction costs, but that's not the point because the transaction costs are not what's counted into in, into the, um, you know, price movement data. It, it's the actual sale price, right? Mm. So I find that very interesting that and even one of those properties was a, what I call a C-grade property because what we see happen in a in a slower market. So we, we call this a, in fact, I'm calling it a normal market because the clearance rates in Sydney have been sitting between 60 and uh, 65. Now they've just gone very close to 70% in the last weekend, but they've been pretty much sitting in that normal market band. Um, that's the auction clearance rates since the end of July. And also the, uh, and they've been creeping up actually. And also the proportion of withdrawn listings has been creeping down. So withdrawn listings is an indication of uh, agent and vendor confidence and clearance rates. The selling is really an indication of buyer confidence, but also, you know, a, a vendor is prepared to meet the market. So it's quite interesting to see that, um, you know, there is the, the data shows actually the market's more robust in Sydney than the commentary would say. <laughs> so it's just looking at different type of data, right? Yeah. And and now I'm looking at these on sales go. Well, the evidence is thus far, and it's look, it's by no means extensive because I've only got 14 examples, and these are only in the inner west. So I haven't even gone to the eastern suburbs or North Shore. But still, that's 12 out of 14 properties, and one of them I was about to say was a C grade, a really crap property that I wouldn't touch with a barge pole. It sold in April this year. And on sold in August this year at a very small, slim gain. It was just over a percent, but still a gain where the official data said prices were falling. So it's it's an interesting. <laughs> so Cookie Boy said, "I need to watch uh, anti sprick videos." I have been watching some of your anti sprick videos, <laughs> and I saw the Tasmania and the North Queensland one. I'm only talking about the inner Sydney here. That's all I'm talking about. All I'm talking about, though, is interesting that agents are running around doom and gloom story because they've found it. They're finding it harder to do their deals. They're actually sure. working. They do. They're they actually, having to work. Exactly. Rather than previously, they could just sort of stand on the sidelines and people would just snap it up, right? They, easy, exactly. easy times. Yeah. yeah. And I have no doubt, you know, far north Queensland is a long way from everywhere. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me what's going on up there. Tasmania even has been over, you know, inflated by a lot of investor activity in recent years. So to some degree, I, I'm not surprised there either. I'm not intimately uh, across those markets, so I can't really comment beyond those broad, broad brushstroke comments. But certainly in the inner Sydney market, all I'm doing is just drawing a comparison between what we hear, the, the official data, what the headlines are, what the agents are saying, and then what I'm seeing. And so when you're talking about you're not going to get what you would have got last year, I think it's more a perception that because in a rising market, 
everyone thinks their, pro- their price is going up. And now people have to adjust those expectations, you know, and so it feels like they're falling, but they may not be in all cases. Anyway, just my two cents worth on that one. No, very good. Thank you. Well, I I wanted to share this with you. This is actually from the Westpac Pulse. They published their monthly pulse today. And I thought it was quite interesting. So I'm just going to read you a couple of. So they started by saying Australia's housing correction is showing no signs of letting up. Prices and turnover again moving lower since our last report and declines spreading to more submarkets. That's their sort of headline. And they're basically saying housing is now hostage to the policy and economic cycle and their overall housing confidence metric, which is their sort of top level one, is, is down at levels it was last seen in October 2015, right? So that's their composite measure. So that's quite interesting. So so from a from a purely um, Westpac analytics perspective, that that's pretty negative. And they go through and look at sentiment and they look at, you know, all of those macro levels, the auction clearances, the listings rates, the broader inflation, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then um, I thought this was quite interesting. They made the point that company insolvencies are beginning to uptick, which is quite interesting. Mm, yeah. Whereas personal bankruptcies have yet to tick up. And that's something that I've seen in my survey. So some of the forced sales are from the businesses that got caught through COVID and never got out. Mm. And now the bankruptcy um, protection is pretty much resu- removed. So basically that's where the, some of the leading edge of, of some of the forced sales are, which I think is quite interesting. So I think generally households and personal bankruptcies are still very low at the moment. Um, it, sorry, just looking at that chart mm, there, mm. it's almost like you've got to take out COVID. You know, because that sort of made an, un, an unreal environment. So yes. I guess look at what what was the situation pre-COVID and now. Yeah. and now It's sort of coming back to where it was because, of course, mm. in, during COVID, people were protected from bankruptcy. Yeah. Right? Businesses were allowed to trade insolvent. The banks mm. didn't call loans in when they were actually um, poorly um, you know, serviced, all those things. Yeah. So, so you're dead right. In a way, this period here is, is not really that relevant. So yeah, you've really so got to be looking at here to here, right? Which yeah. would say, well, at the moment, insolvencies are still, well, they're lower than they were, but they're climbing. Yeah. So that's so that, I, think, I think I thought that was quite interesting. Whereas personal mm. bankruptcies, well, they're still down. Mm. And, of course, the um, CBA data, if we saw that last week, CBA said their delinquency rates are extremely low at the moment. Mm. So they're not seeing any evidence in the numbers of people um, through for sales. But of course, the other factor is we, we also know, I see it in my surveys, that some people are making a decision to sell before they get into too deep because they know that their finances are now under more pressure. And that's something else that, that, that's in, in the mix. So there are some people saying, gee, what do I do? Well, maybe I should sell now before prices slide further. And they are being influenced by what you just said, which is agents now saying, oh, you won't get what you got last year. Yeah, So they're sort of talking prices down, right? Uh, no, they're talking fear up. Uh, yeah. That's what they're doing. <laughs> Bringing the two. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because agents, uh, the sales, uh, I watched this interesting webinar the other day and, and it was talking about, they were talking about the sales profitability in agencies was down quite considerably. Mind you, they're only looking against year, last year and that was so hot you know, I'm, I'm, it's rather annoying, actually. I wish they had like five year averages. Um, so I think, you know, they're, they're hurting a bit. They're not as profitable as they were. And so, and they need listings and they need listings to sell in order to keep the their cash flow going. And how do you get listings, you know, in, in an environment where people are not going to necessarily, or they're not confident they're going to get their price. How do you get listings? You go have to pedal fear. Have, somebody has to have a compelling reason to sell yeah. if they don't think they're going to get their price right, yeah. rightly or otherwise, right? So perception is reality, and so you know what's your compelling reason? Oh God, you know. And look, I'm going back to some of these numbskulls. You know, when when COVID first hit, and some of the some of the emails I saw coming out of these agents who were 12, like, honestly, they've never seen a property cycle, let alone a 
recession, you know, um, you know, telling people that this is it, it's all going to fall off a cliff, you got 50% falls. And, you know, Martin, I've heard your your forecasts, you know. Scenarios, <laughs> not forecasts. <laughs> yes, scenarios. <laughs> and, you know, even at your worst, they were worse, they're predicting yeah. worse than your worst scenario. I know. You know, and it's like, you're 12, for God's sake. You've got no life experience. What the hell do you know? Like, you've barely fully grown. Um, very annoying. And so I, I find that and, and even the smart agents that, that I think actually think about what they're doing, even, I'm finding them even falling into this trap at the moment. So it's like just don't take advice from people who are motivated to get you to sell, you know, because they're not charging you for their advice. If they did, perhaps they might actually advise you differently. That's something worth bearing in mind that um, an agent is there to get a deal. Mm. At any price, they have to, because <laughs> that's how they that's how they live. <laughs> well, they right? want you on the hook, yeah. right? And 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 I'm not bagging agency. No, no, this no, is I'm just a either. fact, just, right? But it's worth understanding the motivation. Absolutely, they yeah. they want you on the hook, and once you're on that hook, they're going to use every trick in their book to get you to actually sell, mm. right? Because without that, they could be up for a marketing cost, and they could be out of pocket. Apart from the fact that they've worked for free. So and they don't want to work for free. Who wants to work for free? And so that's that's pretty much the way it works. I mean, for instance, we do part of what we do in our business is vendor advisory. And and obviously the the um and that's in good deeds, obviously the the demand for vendor advisory and choosing a good agent and managing that process to make sure this doesn't happen to you is so much more important in a slower market where there's all this sort of doom and gloom and conflicting advice, um, you need clear-headed advice. You know, it's very hard to be clear-headed when there's so much emotive um, talk going on everywhere, you know, from headlines right down to the barbecue. Everyone's got an opinion. Everyone knows what's going on. Oh, here we go again. I'm going to yawn. <laughs> and then, of course, the other point is it's a point in time, time observation, right? It doesn't necessarily tell you much mm. about what's going to happen. Right, particularly now where there are so many externalities which could go one of two ways. Well, okay, I'll tell you what's going to happen, right? The market will go down for a while and then it'll go up again for a while and it'll go <laughs> down again for a while and then it'll go up again for a while and this is what happens. <laughs> now, that's a very important observation, right, because there are so many people that I come across, but you know, even on my one-on-one -on -one sessions, who quote the period from 2006 seven up to about 2017 or 2020 and so that only ever goes up right mm. they have never seen the down part of the cycle right the problem is property markets do go up and they do go down and they do but go they, up and they do go down but they don't go down as far as they went up in the previous boom. And in fact, Domain came out with some research on this, which I thought was very, very interesting. And it went back nearly 30 years over, I think, can't remember how many cycles, maybe four in there. And actually there's more than that. There's about six cycles in there. And it showed that each downturn was, oh, I've got to try and remember. I think it was roughly the third of duration of the up, to, up the upswing. And it was about 30% of the gain in the previous upswing. Now, I could have my numbers all wrong, but it was consistent that each downturn is shorter, significantly shorter, and significantly less in terms of uh, the loss versus the previous gain, which means that if you're waiting, you're trying to ride out this market, right, you... A, no one picks it until it's already happened. So no one picks the bottom until it's past tense. No one picks the peak until it's past tense. Oh, that was the peak. We all know it after we saw it, right? <laughs> And the problem is that, yes, on mass, prices rise, the market as a whole, but nobody buys the whole market. They don't buy a segment. You know, it's not, you can't buy a, property, a residential property ETF, right? You have to buy an individual house or apartment. And you might buy something that goes down in value and doesn't go up because that happens. You know, there's still roughly 10%, give or take a bit, um, every single quarter in this country sells at a loss. You know, this happens all the time, regardless of when the markets are going up or they're going down. If at the height of the last boom, something like 9.8% of properties were still selling at a loss. So, 
you know, I, I will say markets overall, the, the booms are better than the downturns, et cetera, et cetera. But if you don't choose a good asset, you won't take advantage of that. And I tell you what, I've seen people have lost money in a rising market. Woo-hoo, how do yeah. you do that? Yep. How do you manage that? Yeah, it takes an extra skill, doesn't it? To, uh, it to is. Do that. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, now, let's sort of move the conversation forward a little bit because – I've got a bunch of questions that people sent me before, but th- this, is, this is a really interesting one. It gets to the heart of when you are thinking about a property transaction, what's driving the decision, right? So th- this is a family that's living in Australia currently. They own a property here. They've got UK roots, and for various family reasons, they need to go back to the UK, and they're going back long term. So they want to basically sell here, buy in the UK. And they're paranoid about these two property markets moving in different directions. They want to buy roughly similar price and similar type of property in the two, in the two countries. But that, that, they've got caught up in this, oh, well, maybe we should rent for a bit and see whether property prices in the UK drop a bit. Or, you know, if we sell now in Australia, are we giving away value? And they've got themselves in, a, in, a, in an absolute dune loop, right? You've, they, forgotten, you've forgotten currency. Yeah, good point. <laughs> yep. Good point. That's a very important element in the mix too, right? Mm. <laughs> so, Doom loop, yeah. So I think, I don't know what you think, but I think what they've got themselves into is they've got the financial dimensionality of the problem in the centre of the mind. Mm. And I think they're missing the, the main point, which is fundamentally a property is somewhere to live and somewhere to you know, grow and live a family with, Right. Yeah, there's a financial consequence of those decisions, but I get the feeling from the question that they've actually got this th- on the wrong perspective. But what do you think? I look, I agree with you. The problem is with trying to work out the market is that you've probably got equal chances of actually got I would say unequal chances of lucking it and getting it right than you would of totally stuffing it up because nobody is an expert in the sense that they control the market. You might be able to read the market. You might be able to understand what's happening. Um, I can read the market and understand what's happening, but I can't control it, and I don't know exactly when it will peak. And that's just here, let alone trying to work out the same wherever they want to buy. And, you know, and then plus then you've got currency to deal with as well. So because none of that is controllable, you have to make decisions based on your needs as as a family, right? You have to decide on... What do we want to do? Because you, you could put all your bets on the, you know, the Australian property market continuing to fall and, and the UK will fall more. You could put all your bets on that. You, you form your thesis on that and say, right, that's what I'm going to act on. You have to be prepared that you could be totally wrong. And if you only have one asset, you you just can't risk it. Like you just have to make the decision for other reasons, for the right reasons for you as a family, and then the rest just has to fall in line and whatever happened happens because you can't control it. So it's tough and it's really hard, particularly when you've only got one asset. If you had a share portfolio, you could dollar cost average your exit. <laughs> you, know, you, could, you, could, you can smooth that out, but that's the problem with, with property, really. It's lumpy. Horribly lumpy. Mm. <laughs> and you probably, you know, you might have – a few properties, but most people have one property. Yeah. And the the point is that the number of variables that you're trying to solve for, exchange rates, relative income growth, relative property mm. growth in the two areas, the different transaction costs of buying and selling, which is something else that people forget. And uh, by the way, if you buy in the UK and you don't have residence in the UK, you get hit over the head by a four by two. Uh, also, uh, their chain system. Yeah. Yeah. Like who wants to be trying to enter one of those? You want to basically try to be cashed up and, and not have to, you know, ugh, yuck, that's a horrible system. That, right. It could all unravel. You Correct. get everything perfectly timed yeah. and you could get there and the whole thing falls over because six months after you bought a property, somebody in the chain falls over. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> It, it, it is it is not, not a pretty sight. So so my conclusion, I mean, this this was, I got permission to actually tell this story because I, it was a really interesting conversation and we, we, we had a, a one for one that one to one that went for an hour and a half as we sort of unpicked all of this. But, mm. the, but the net conclusion was that they'd got themselves into a stew about the economics. Mm. And they'd lost sight of the fact that 
This is about a life. This is about a family. This is about somewhere to live. And look, you might win some, you might lose some. But if you're trying to pick what you do to try and just optimise the financials, you've got the wrong agenda. You miss the point, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. 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 I think it's very good advice, Martin. We try. <laughs> Don't always succeed because often, and it's interesting because, um, and again, I'm, I'm not telling tales out of school because I, I got their agreement to tell this story, um, but they actually didn't necessarily have the same view. When I sort oh, of the couple, yeah, the couple, the pu- yeah, 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 yeah. When I started <laughs> teasing it out, I realised that the bloke was actually on the numbers, right? Mm. Um, the lady of the house, with you know, thinking about the kids and the family, w- 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 was trying to counteract that by talking about these other issues but she wasn't really being heard so i ended up more as a sort of a a, a counselor right rather than actually my my sort of normal role but it was a very interesting conversation and it shows you the the complexity that you can get into when when wow. these these things come along and you know when you think about international and everything else but i i think there's an object lesson there even for local transactions too I have lots of conversations like that because um, I do individual strategy sessions with people. I, I don't I actually don't promote that, even though I just said it on your um, <laughs> YouTube channel. We'll, we'll, we'll keep quiet about it. <laughs> don't tell anybody. Um, but every now and then um, I do these personal strategy sessions and, and it very much is around, it, like you say, unpicking um, is a good one. And what I find though, and it's the same with, with often with property searches as well with couples, right? You will often find it's like a Venn diagram, you know, what, and look, I'm going to go heterosexual couples, but not everyone's a heterosexual couple, but let's just do a he and a she because a majority still are. Um, you know, he his circle and his requirements are in one side and hers are the other and in the middle of uh, where they overlap. And, and it seems to be that the more stressed they are, the more these circles pull apart from each other and the smaller the overlap in the middle. And what I have found from surveying, you know, in the in this classic heterosexual type scenario where the bloke is the breadwinner, you know, with the big white collar job in the city and the wife is taking a few years out of her career to look after the kids and they're looking for a family home, is it quite often the bloke is, and I can't even believe we're talking about this in the in the the teens, by the way, that this is still stereotypically quite dominant. But the bloke is very much, I'm gonna have to work till I'm 80 to pay for the house that's big enough for the lifestyle and all the rest of it so she can swan around drinking coffee and go to the gym. Um, and, you know, and I I sort of get both sides. I do get both sides. I think if, if anyone, whether it be a man or a woman, is going to be at home with children um, and take a time out of their career for a period of time, you want to have connection to people and your community. You want that and you want that at your doorstep, right? Because you, you know, if you do have a career, you're sacrificing a lot to to stay home with little people for a period of time if that's your choice, right? But yeah, the the financial burden falls more heavily on one part partner. And it is interesting when that stress levels go up, they do, they pull away and they really just, you know, they put up walls around their defending their their needs and their desires. So half the 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 role, like you say, is like a counselor to sort of mediate and get them back on the same page, get them back in this in the in the center of the, you know, get these circles overlapping more. But um, and it's amazing how responsive people are if they are in a in a nice, healthy relationship. It actually really it's quite amazing how responsive people can be to the to a little positive intervention <laughs> yeah it, it is very interesting and i would make another point and that is that sometimes um they try and analyze their way out of it right because it's scary yeah and and so you know if particularly if you're a detail-oriented person you're going to Urd of the data to try to justify what is a big scary decision, mm. you know. So it's like giving them permission sometimes to say that's actually not where the answer lies. Absolutely, very interesting. Well, you know, that's why I wanted to have that conversation because, for me, there were a whole, a sort of, a series of life lessons which I think are quite important. Here's a, here's mm. another question for you. So this is actually a first time buyer in New South Wales, um, buying in the range where they've now got the choice with regard uh-huh. to the land tax, right? And just to explain for those watching from interstate, up to a certain level, 
1.5, I mm -hmm. think, right? You can yep. now pick if you want to pay the stamp duty up front or you can not pay the stamp duty and effectively continue to pay every year. Once, land tax. once you've done, the land tax then stays annualised for subsequent sales, so you can't reverse it later. No, it doesn't. No. It doesn't. Exactly. That was what they originally wanted to do, mm. but they couldn't get that through, okay. so it does not pass on to subsequent... Um, oh, okay. I missed, I missed that to change. Okay, right. So the next purchaser could switch it back. Look, they, if their next purchaser is a first home buyer, they have the option. If they're not a first home buyer, they will not have the option. They have to pay stamp duty. Mm. So this is an interesting one. Okay, can I just say a little bit of a plug? If anyone is a first home buyer and they're trying to work through this, right, um, on your first home buyer guide podcast, episode 98, Megan and I went through a whole bunch of scenarios in that podcast around talking about how to work out, um, you know, what, What's right for you? But one of the things I discovered in, in that scenario uh, research was there's a really interesting little trick. Trick. So basically anything that roughly speaking 750K to 1.5, if you're intending on being in it a long time, I mean, you'd have to be there probably 20 years or something before the land tax catches up to the, cop, the, the cost of the stamp duty roughly. It's very, that's rough because it, it's complicated. That's why you should listen to that podcast episode. But if you are going to be a rent vester, or if you think ever that you might rent that property out, it could be very the opposite, very costly, and you could be stuck with it. So it's well worthwhile having a run through with your accountant if you think even the slightest idea that you might one day want to rent that property out. Yeah. Because it changes the uh, calculus completely, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah, so yeah. it goes from I think it's I think it's four hundred dollars plus point three percent of the unimproved land value, right? Yep. That's if you're going to occupy the property. I think it's four hundred plus point point three. What's interesting is it's the unimproved land value. Whereas if you pay stamp duty, you're paying on the purchase price. Yep. So if you buy a million dollar house or a million dollar apartment right, or a million-dollar unrenovated house or a million-dollar renovated house, um, you are paying the same stamp duty. Whereas if you buy a million-dollar dump, um, you know, your land value is going to be X, it, it, depending on where it is, how big the land, where is that land located. You know, I've looked at different property sales. One was like $760,000 and the other one was like a million and the land value was the same. So it's not tied to your purchase price. And also if you're buying an apartment, there's bugger all land value compared to a house. So, you know, the actual um, ongoing cost or expectation of cost for land value for, you, for your land tax is highly variable um, and not at all tied to the purchase price. But if you decide you're going to rent it out, that goes from 0.3% to I think 1.5% yep. plus, I can't remember, it's $1,500 I think it is plus one5 top of my head um anyway it's significant and the thing is that if you buy that and pay the stamp duty and that unimproved land value is underneath the threshold and you might end up not paying land tax at all as an investor for that property in the current regime in the current um set, set up so in particular for first home buyers who think they might become investors that really needs some investigation yeah and interestingly, of course, uh, what's tended to happen is that where people have gone for the um, spreading the costs out, it's actually given them a little bit more reach with what mm. they can afford to buy now. So one of the observations is that there's been a little bit of an uptick in some of the property that's actually in that band. Well, of, of course. Funny that. <laughs> Exactly. What do you expect? The thing is, though, when you think about it in the whole scheme of things, what do we have? 600 transactions per year. Um, generally speaking, on average, you have 600 property transactions in this country. In New South Wales, I wish I knew the number off the top of my head, but we have a basically on an average year, we have 100,000. 100, so of those 600,000, 100,000 are first home buyers, right? Now, the proportion in New South Wales, I think it's roughly 50,000. First home buyers in New South Wales per annum. You can probably correct me on that, Martin. Um, so in the whole scheme of things, it's going to impact obviously some prices here. Mm. But 
Um, it's marginal. To be honest, right? yeah, yeah, it is marginal. Yeah. And I also think too that that it's probably one of the very few first home buyer schemes that actually does help people who want to buy in Sydney. Most of them, the cut off, the caps are far too low to be much use to people wanting to buy in Sydney. Right. And the final point to make, of course, and the unknown is what the rate of the land tax will be in later years, right? Because there's no guarantee that they won't move it. No. Um, and also, obviously, your unimproved land value is going to go up. Yeah. You know, so that does go up. It, it, it's not the same as sale prices, let's face it, but it will go up. I think they calculate it in rolling through you average or something like that. Um, so, yeah, it's going to go up. And, you know, even if they don't change the rate, it's still going to go up. Just not a lot. No, not a lot, but still in principle. <laughs> yes. It could, and, and they could change the rates as well just to add insult mm. to injury. So, uh, and They could. The, the difficulty is there is that, you, you know, you've got no certainty. At least if you've paid up front, you know what you paid and therefore it's, it's, it's sunk and it's locked, right? Look, it's true, but the reality is this does help first home buyers to get into the market quicker yep. um, and also potentially uh, reduce your, uh, le- uh, what do you call it, lenders mortgage insurance yep. um so there's a number of benefits uh and also you know more cash in the bank if you if you use that money if you did have it saved and you use it keep it as a buffer so there's lots of good things about it for first home buyers also first home buyers on average don't hold the property that long you know if you hold it yep. for 10 years you're well within most calculations um in terms of uh, having to pay it back um, in terms of your your land tax uh, liability over that ten year period being more than your stamp duty, so in most cases you'll find it is a, a, you know it's, it it makes sense to take the land tax option, but you do have to just consider your future use of that property and how long you're going to be in it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, here's here's another one. This is from Eric, and, and basically this is to do with granny flats. And, and basically the question is, why is Veronica anti-granny flats? <laughs> hey, I'm not sure if you've heard my analogy, which is putting a granny flat on a lot of the power properties that people put granny flats on in order to increase the rent is a bit like sewing an extra leg on a greyhound and <laughs> expecting it to run faster. <laughs> so <laughs> most properties that people put granny flats in the backyard, right, of, are devalued effectively. They are they are um, taking away something that is valuable in that property, and that is a backyard. Mm. So when you, if your block is big enough to be able to accommodate a granny flat as well as the main house without compromising too much on outdoor space and privacy and all those sorts of things, then knock yourself out, go and build a granny flat. But if your house is basically just big enough that when you plonk a granny flat at the back, you're staring out the kitchen window right into the the, the wall of the granny flat that you've compromised. You've you got to have the front garden, which is used for the front house and the back garden, what's left of the back garden gets used for the granny flat. Privacy is impacted, all that sort of stuff. You basically cut down your future buyer for that property to an investor who wants a cash flow um, positive potentially investment. Right. So that has narrowed your future buyer pool considerably. You haven't even found someone like yourself, like the value add investor. They've gone out of the mix. There's only one type of buyer, and maybe, maybe, maybe that family that doesn't want an outdoor space and really wants mum living out the back. So there's a very, <laughs> there's a very limited buyer pool. And what you've done is taken away some of the people that would have bought the property beforehand. And you've, you've actually spent money to add insult to injury. You've spent money to reduce your future buyer pool for that property. So because of that, it's going to impact your growth rate and it's going to impact your free and easy ability to sell that property in the future. And f- fundamentally, you've impacted the capital growth in order to get a few extra dollars a week rent. And the rent doesn't compound, whereas capital growth does. And that's where you shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> and Cookie Boy also added, and to say nothing, all the parking issues that often are created by lots of people doing this and they've got nowhere to put the cars. That do. And I love your comment, Cookie Boy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great one. Um, so yeah, it's so very fascinating. And, uh, uh, I think your analogy is spot on, you know. <laughs> I, I, and yet, I can tell you the number of times that um, 
you know, my one-on-one -on -one conversations, the idea of how can I create more value in the property, which, again, it, I sort of often probe, well, why? why do you feel why? like you have to? Exactly. Like if you, yeah, yeah, if yeah, you yeah. buy a good asset, I mean, mind you, having said that, having said that, right, mm. I, I did, um, I did, a, I, I put together a video actually, which I haven't actually published yet on Suburb Help website, but I mean to one of these days. And what it is, I did a, some research over 11 properties that had sold and unsold over a 10 year period in New South Wales. So there was a, a mix of um, rural, urban, some apartments, some villas and houses in that mix. The one common denominator from the higher performers across and, and the growth, the nominal growth, right, before I sort of really got in there and worked out, um, you know, how much money had been spent on renovations and whatever, um, the nominal growth ranged from over this 10-year period 64%, I think, to 400% or 396%. So huge difference. So somebody only got 64% return over, over 10 years, whereas others got nearly four times, right? So just over half to four times. Big mm. difference, right? Mm. Now, the four times was um, actually a rebuild. So let's let's take that back, that knock it back. But the best performers um, tripled their value, you know, so it's possible that somebody could only get half their money back or 0.6% um, and someone else could triple their value over the same 10-year period, right? And so it's really interesting looking in into, well, what are the factors you know, what makes one property do so well and something else do so badly? The common denominator actually was value add. But you got to value add in the appropriate way, right? And putting a granny flat on and ruining, value add is adding something, not literally <laughs> adding something, but adding something that makes that property more appealing, right? I reckon a three-legged dog would run faster than a five-legged dog, by the way, smooth operator. <laughs> um, but so you, your value add means making the property better, right? Not making getting more rent necessarily. Getting more rent isn't necessarily making it better. And often when you make it better, you can get more rent, but maybe not quite as much as that. But anyway, so that's why I don't like granny flats in most cases. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I think they wanted to hear your long run on Ranny Flats because they knew that this was going to be a, a good conversation point. My right? rant. <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> uh, but, but points so well made. And uh, I, again, I, I sometimes come back to this question about, you know, what is the property there for? What are you trying to achieve? And, and, mm. and again, it goes back to this. If you're driven by that financial return angle, well, you're going to make some interesting decisions, but not necessarily good decisions. Yeah. Right? It's getting the metrics right. No. It, it's, you know, and this is the thing when you, you look, if you're going to invest, you want to get a return. Otherwise, why bother doing it? But people are chasing the wrong returns. They don't understand the magic of compounding. And really what is at the core of that is buying an asset that lots of people are going to want in the future, right? So, Anything you can do to increase the types of buyers or the amount of buyers or the appeal of that property, that's what you want, right, as opposed to increasing the rent because that is not necessarily increasing the appeal of the property. And, and I've done case study after case study after case study on this over the years and, it, you know, I can, I can see it's so, it sticks out like dog's balls just to continue that um, theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Plenty, of, plenty of doggy related uh, conversations. <laughs> and uh, for those of you watching, the I, um, I had a three-legged dog who... Um, <laughs> Do you? <laughs> I, I did have a three-legged dog, uh, Winston. It was a Labradoodle. And uh, for about five years, he went around quite happily with three legs, having got cancer on the fourth. And I tell you, he could go faster than a four-legged legged dog in the right direction. <laughs> Couldn't turn very easily, but once he got going, <laughs> boy, I, I took him down the road once uh, one evening uh, and he saw a possum and he was off and he, he, he beat the other dog to the possum <laughs> so with three legs. So. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say your other dog's name is? Did you say Luna? Yeah, so currently I've got Luna and Meteor. That is bizarre because that little dog that you saw earlier before yeah, yeah. we went live is yeah, yeah. named Luna. We've got a Luna too. Oh, it's a 
Well, it's a great name for a dog. Um, yeah. Luna, my Luna was actually from a farm and she was called Luna. The other one was called Meatball, but we couldn't have a dog called Meatball. So we tried to Meatball. find a sort of a similar sounding name and thought, oh, well, Luna Meteor. So that's how we ended up with Meteor. So. Fabulous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, um, here's, an, here's an interesting one. Um, this, this is from um, Clara. Um, it's about high-speed internet. Mm. Is high-speed internet or low-speed internet enough of a determinant to actually shape a potential sale or not, or is it marginal? I can only go on anecdotal evidence, mm. right, that, yes, it is, um, because particularly with the work from home, you know, the change to working uh, patterns and even hybrid working from home. Um, and so anecdotally, I've heard that it is. So can't speak to any evidence or uh, research that I've read, only anecdotally. Um, but that's assuming that people pay attention and check, right? If they don't know, then it's not going to impact, yep. is it? It's only they're going to find out afterwards. So it's a good question to ask if you're moving to an area where you suspect it might have an issue. Yeah, and, and the point there is that um, even if you've got um, – high potential capacity it may not come to your particular premise because you may not have got fiber to the premise yes fiber so, to the is it fiber, fiber to the node fiber to the nude yes, yes. <laughs> um i had fiber to the node when i first started um doing shows it was horrendous so i ended well, I up imagine. having fiber to the premise and um, it was a huge 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 change my, my theory is that if you've got high speed internet and you're looking to sell the property, shout it from the rooftops. Yes. Because yes. actually it can be a significant attractor. Mm. 100%. I yeah. would definitely shout it from the rooftops. Yeah. Yeah. And often my experience also is that agents don't often recognize it as a potential additional positive to put on the, on, on the, on the details. So I always say to people, if you're in the happy situation where you've got high speed internet available, broadcast it from the rooftops because it can make quite a difference for many people if they're working from home or if they've got uh, you know a large family with lots of internet users all at mm. the same time it's a difference between a peaceful evening and a non-peaceful evening so it can be quite important we just manage it imagine if we have another pandemic and you know it's quite likely yeah. <laughs> well, apparently it is unfortunately <laughs> looking more likely mm. you know yeah. you get locked in again with all your kids and the whole palaver you want high speed internet yeah yeah and it's interesting, there was an interesting one from Jason. I was going to put that one up. Let's put one second. Flick that and then that. He said, uh, I thought perhaps access to reasonable internet is a factor. Look at Sorrento <laughs> and Victoria, fire to the no with no upgrades to fire to the premise available at the moment. Internet is an essential service. I agree with that. It is for many mm. people. Yeah. And um, that's why I'm making the point that I actually think it is a very relevant question to ask. So if you're buying, do the research. You can, of course, look up the p property address and see what the best available service is if you go to the MBN's sort of lookup system. Um, and then if you're on the other side of it and you've actually got high speed, make sure it's on the on the um, the details because it can make quite a difference. All right, now this is one up your street, to Veronica. Um, buyers agents, this is from Sam. Um, <laughs> he said, I've used buyers, ag buyers agents twice in my few, last few years. The first time, it was a really good experience. The second time, it was a horrendous experience. Are there any regulations relating to buyer's agents? What, are their, what is their role? What should their role be? And how, does anybody check up to see whether they do what they say they do? Oh, do we have another hour and a half for me <laughs> to rant about this one? Okay. No. Yes and no. Okay. Here's a problem. Is it, We have a real problem with buyer's agents, and I am one, and I'm an advocate for people using them. However, I'm also an advocate for buyer's agent upskilling, and I'm an advocate for consumers need to understand how to choose between a good one and a bad one because there is too many crap buyer's agents out there. 
The reason there are too many crap buyers agents out there is because there's a lot of myths around about how glamorous being a buyers agent is. And I think there's a whole crop of new television shows that's not going to do any any favors here, right? And, you know, I'll put my hand up for probably contributing to this myth. You know, you're swatting around looking at lovely homes and and then just do a deal and bang and everyone loves you. Right. It is that is nothing like the role of a good buyer's agent. Now, so that's sort of the perception, I guess, um, uh, around a lot of people that are entering into the industry. And then you've got a licensing regime across the country, which is woefully substandard, is not fit for purpose. The licensing process that a buyer's agent needs to go through is basically a, um, they need to become a, a real estate agent, And in order to do that, they will learn all about how to sell property and how to lease it, rent it out, and property managing. They won't learn pretty much jack shit about being a buyer's agent. And in New South Wales, for instance, there is a a module that elective module that people can choose to do, which is fantastic. But the all the um, the compulsory subjects. We've got really very little relevance to a buyer's agent. So what that means, and in New South Wales and in ACT, you now need, in recent recent times this has changed, you now need two years' experience before you can run your own business. But prior to that, you could get your licence, set up shop straight away, right? In Victoria, you need a a year's experience um, and then you can get your higher grade license and set up shop, but you actually need some work experience. That's great. Other states and territories, you can get your license where you've done no learning whatsoever about the skills required to be a buyer's agent, and then you go and set up shop. Now, the problem with that, the last boom that we had was that so many consumers were trying desperately to get into the marketplace and they're thinking, I know my secret weapon is going to be a buyer's agent. Every good buyer's agent was basically at capacity. And so there was an opportunity, <laughs> stripe a cat, way to go. There was an opportunity there for all these new entrants to get into the industry and start earning money from day one because people were desperately trying to get an edge in this market. And when you're so desperate, FOMO's going crazy, um, these people were getting getting business and they shouldn't have been getting business because so many of them don't know what they're doing. Now, for Suburb Help, I actually put together a database of buyers agents across the country who I've interviewed myself and I've looked for references and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I can, in one call, I can start getting the antennas going off as to whether someone's going to be anywhere near any good or not, right? And at at one extreme, I'll be talking to buyers agents that are local specialists. They're well embedded in their area. They understand the pros and cons of property in their area. They know how to identify a good property. They've got their client's best interest at heart. They will do all the relevant due diligence. At the other end of the scale, we've got people who've done their license. They've decided it's a glamorous industry and yeehaw, I want to give up my day job uh, and I love property. And you know, they don't know the first thing about due diligence. They don't know the first thing about actually how to do the, the job. Age sales agents think they're a laughing stock and will run rings around them. But at the other end of that, the worst experience um, call I had was with a, a person who's in Queensland, in a regional area, in an area where there's not, I don't know whether there's much call for buyers agents, you know, but establishing a business and, and, and a marketplace there, supposedly educating people as to the benefits of using a buyer's agent and the rest of it, had zero experience, had done a a fancy course as well as the as the license. And I said to him, I said, that's great. So what tell me about your due diligence process. And he said, Oh, well, I don't, I don't believe anything that an agent says. I said, Well, that's cool, but what you do, what's your due diligence pro can say due diligence process? Well, I don't, you know, like didn't know what to say. And I said, Okay, do you want me to explain to you? Queensland is the state in Australia where there's the least amount of annual disclosure. disclosure. So, therefore, it's up to you as a buyer's agent to get a whole host of documents um, and information to be able to present to your client a case for or against that property and whether there's any risks associated with it or not and whether there's development risks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and also to do the pricing research to make sure you're not just pressing a button on CoreLogic to to flick out an AVM to say what you should pay for it. There's an entire process that you need to go for through. How have you gone about putting that together? He was struck dumb because he didn't 
know what I was talking about. That was the most terrific phone call I had. So the person that wrote in saying had one great experience and then one shit experience, unfortunately the great experience probably set them up expecting to have another great experience. And then if they had it the other way around, they would have only ever used one buyer's agent. And the problem is that we have legislators or we have regulators, I should say, and there's all this movement around, don't have regulators. Well, actually, we need to be regulated because when you don't have regulation, you've got people that have no experience, um, have not learned anything, none of the skills, and yet they qualify to be a buyer's agent and put their name on the door and 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 start charging people money to do the job. And they don't even know what's involved in the job. So, yeah, I don't know. The, the regulators don't seem to review it importantly enough to recognise the risks. And I really do not understand why, what is so hard about that, but they don't. No, so, no. Yeah. It, 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 is, <laughs> it is interesting. And my conversations with people who are thinking about, well, you know, if I use a buyer's agent, surely that gives me an advantage, to which mm. I reply, it depends. It does depend. Right? You yeah. might get an advantage, but you might not. You might be paying extra money for no no good reason. Um, so at least ask some hard questions of a buyer's agent. So what, what are the two or three critical questions that somebody who might be thinking of using a buyer's agent should ask of that agent before they engage? Well, look, for starters, this is why we put together Suburb Help was, was partly to help people buy narrowing down a list of buyers agents that we could be confident to recommend that you, they can't pay to be on you know they've got to pass my bullshit test now in my bullshit test so you can go to suburb help and and send us an inquiry if you want to but if you want to pass your own bullshit test you ask them about the due diligence process the problem is that you need to know what they should be telling you so you need to learn what needs to be done so that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is explain to me your local specialization because you do not want one of these fly in, fly out buyers agents. I mean, I've got my, I've heard stories that make your hair curl, right? Buyers agents, you know, not even looking at properties and sending some local, you know, in, in another state, sending a local property manager to inspect it for them. You know, like give me a break. Like it's just so ugh, recalcitrant. So, you know, I want everyone to understand you need to get a local specialist, right? And if you don't get a local specialist, you run the risk of somebody is just going to, does not understand the, the drivers of that local market. You're not necessarily going to buy a good asset in that area, right? So that's the first thing, due diligence, the local specialization. You know, you want to know what sort of properties they've been buying in that area. Um, and and really cast a critical eye on those. Ask for evidence. What have you been buying? And the other thing you can do, you can call local agents and sales agents. The problem is that's a bit difficult there because some buyers agents will pay local agents referral fees, and so they're going to be biased. You know, so you'd be careful about that. Um, the other thing that you can do is there was one other thing I was going to suggest. And, oh, um, you want to talk to, well, yeah, ask them for a list of everything they bought and randomly pick three properties and ask to talk to those clients. Don't let them give you the clients that they want to give you if they offer you to be reference checked, right? So that's another thing you can do. Yeah, and the object lesson there is if you're going down that route, you got some tire kicking to do, you mm. can't just assume because it says buy an agent on their on their chest, as it were, that they're actually automatically qualified and appropriate and will do you a good job. That's the key message, I think, for that one. And this is why I've started, you know, I think I do you mind if I talk about the part the mentoring program? Yeah, no, go, go for it. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So literally last night I delivered module 12 of a 12 module um, program which is now going to be a, a 12 month program for new and almost buyers agents so wannabes that are doing the licensing course and new buyers agents because there's this huge problem with people that are attracted to the industry because they like property they might even like people which I think is pretty important just quietly um 
And then they go and do the course and then they're stuck because they're like, I know that this course hasn't taught me what I need to know. I do want to do a good job and I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. And it's really hard to get a job in an industry with a a high proportion of micro businesses as well um, that aren't sort of, you know, hiring necessarily. And also people who do hire, want, even an associate or a trainee, they, they actually want someone with experience, even for a trainee role. So it's really difficult to get into getting mentoring and getting, um, to, you know, part of the part of the problem, you know, with the licensing situation where you can go and get your license and go and set up business. A, a lot of the reason people do set up business is because they can't actually get a job with a decent buyer's agent. You know, so it's a real problem entering the industry. And that's the reason that I've put together this this program and I'll be launching it properly next year to help people actually learn the skills they need to do the job properly. And that actually will make them more, um, more, I guess, employable as well if they don't want to set up their own business. But if they are trying to set up in New South Wales or ACT or Victoria, they don't have the option. They're going to have to work for someone else and that's a good thing but they also need to to take along a bunch of skills so that give them an advantage there but it, it's a really difficult business to get a nice clear pathway into it if you want to be a good buyer's agent yeah absolutely um, a good one is uh, is the critical thing thanks for that so yep. there you go that was uh, um i think uh, the, the person who asked the question was lucky the first time, not lucky the second time. <laughs> yeah, and I'm so sad to hear that. It yeah. was, to pay somebody, yeah. right, to do a worse job yeah. than you could have done yourself Correct. is just shocking and Absolutely. happens a lot. It does, unfortunately. Um, now, uh, Jason asked this question, um, is it possible that by – I need to go, I can't read it there. Let me just put it here so I can see it. Uh, <laughs> is it possible buyer's agents go and do a deal with a seller's agent to achieve more money in their pocket? aren't a lot of real estate agents in it for the money and will play between the buyer and the seller to the best advantage for them. I don't represent the seller or the buyer. Well, that's getting into a very significantly deep question about who's working for who. Mm, okay. This is all about follow the money, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's look at sales agents just for a minute. A sales agent is paid by the vendor, right? So you would think that their loyalty should be with the vendor, except for one very critical thing. <laughs> The vendor, it's a commission, not a fee for service, and it means that the vendor only pays them when and if they sell. And so that sales agents, everything that they do has to get a deal across the line. And you would think that's going to be at the best possible price, the highest possible price, and many many of them do. But at the end of the day, what's more important is a sale because they need to get paid. Pardon me. So that's the sales agent's motivation. A buyer's agent, if they are charging a fee in the same way a sales agent does, i.e. a commission, and it's paid only if they buy, they've got the same problem. That buyer's agent is motivated to get that person to buy come hell or high water. They're not interested in the price that you pay, they're not interested if it's a good asset. They just want you off their books so they can get their money. So how you pay someone is very, very important. Now, there's lots of different models in the buyer's agency space. Um, we, like, for instance, in Good Deeds, we a fee for service and it's, it's we, we charge a fixed fee, right? It's not a percentage. Some buyer's agents charge a percentage. A lot of other ones will also charge a fixed fee. Some will say it's a percentage, but we'll fix it. And I'm like, well, what is why anyway it's just annoying why complicate it so and then there's people that will have a a nice big um opening um fee so like an engagement fee and it's significant right and then there's others that charge you a thousand dollars and the rest of it when you actually commit to a property well you've got to think well what are they motivated to do they're motivated to get payday right so you want someone who charges a reasonable engagement fee you want some i charge a monthly retainer as well it's still a fixed fee they only pay this the same amount of money at the end of it but the incentive is taken away to be thinking i need payday i need cash flow in the business and i don't think that way anyway but look let's face it humans are what humans are so that that is a temptation right so i've taken that right out That's in my business. So everyone's a bit different. So in terms of this collusion, I guess the question sort of infers it could be collusion at times. There are some agencies that do collude. There's no doubt about that. 
Um, but generally speaking, it's not as neat as that. It, you know, generally speaking, it's hard to line up exactly the buyer's agent having the, the exact right clients at the same time as the selling agent having the exact right properties for those clients. Um, so I wouldn't think that there's too much of that going on, although I do know that there are some sales agents that are selling their open house lists to buyer's agents who then, you know, go and cold call these people, which personally I think is a is a breach of privacy. Um, I can't imagine anyone actually signing an agreement to say, oh yes, I'll let you take my t- my name and number, and then sell it on to somebody else. So so there's there are some little deals that sort of get done like that. There are some buyers agents that are very transactional in their approach. And there are some sales agents that are equally transactional and are not necessarily focused on the best outcome for their vendor. And when those two get together, they, they're just going to do a deal that gets it gets a deal done. I've seen plenty of buyers agents pay way too much money for property because it's easy for them. I don't know how they pitch it to their clients. I don't know how they sell it to their clients, but the sales agents tell me stories. So it does happen, right? Um, and it shouldn't happen, but it does. So um, that's another reason to talk to sales agents. I guess if they're going to bag out any, any buyers agents, you want to know if they're going to bag out the one you're about to use, but you know, once again, they may not tell you. So it's a, it's, it's, it's tricky. <laughs> and you know, the concept of following the money mm. and understanding people's motivations is people, frankly, are coin operated, right? Yeah. So not all. No, not you no, and me, Martin. No, no. Well, that's true. Not everybody, but but <laughs> most. Some, some are, and and unfortunately, quite a few in the industry are. Mm. Um, so you need to understand that. And uh, I always say to people, you know, go in with an open mind, but make sure you have got your filters on. Make sure what you're doing is actually thinking about well, why are they why why are they telling me this, right? What's really going on here, right? So step back a little bit. And actually, I think that's a really, you know, what, that idea of stepping back and just thinking about, well, hang on, what's going on here mm. is really important because you get sucked into it and you sort of, yes. you know, sometimes it becomes an emotional thing rather than actually a logical thing. And uh, to my mind, it's really important to just keep that balance in, in, in train. It, absolutely. And you also got to remember, sales agents more so than buyers agents um, do a lot of training on dialogue heaps of it, right? Now you hang around them enough, you start hearing the same thing over and over again. You go, right, I know what they mean when they say that. Right? Da, 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 da. That's, 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 you know, what's what we do. We interpret that's one of our jobs, right? For our clients. So sales agents um, will run rings around a lot of buyers agents in terms of dialogue. And they'll also run rings around um, buyers, you know, individual buyers, because they haven't heard all this, the, the lines like the way we have, right? Um, and so, you know, so you, you've got to be very mindful um, of all that going on. There was a point I was going to go with that and it'll come back to me. Anyway, I've lost my train of thought because I was looking at some of the messages coming Sorry. up. <laughs> How often does it happen, the collusion and buying the open house list? The, oh, the other thing, off markets, right, okay. So so this is most buyers agents go, oh, well, this is my value add. I'll save you time. I'll save you money and I'll get you access to off markets. And it's like, yeah, good. We all get access to off markets. I've heard sales agents say to me, I save all my off markets up for X, Y, Z buyers agents because they're not, they're not discerning and they'll sell that idea of the off market and the exclusivity and the scarcity to their unsuspecting clients. They'll pay too much. And I won't even give you that shit, Veronica, because I know that you and your team won't even look at it. And I've had a number of agents say that to me over the years, right? So that's what you got to be careful. So when a, the buyer's agent is banging on to you about, oh, yeah, I'll get access to you know 80% of what a buyer's off market, rah, rah, rah. It's like, well, really? I want to look at the whole pot. I want to look at everything that's available for sale because I really want to assess whether that's a really good off market and whether it's a reasonable price. Or if it is at a premium, should I pay it because it's so unique to what I what, what I need? Or am I falling for this sort of magic of the, the hidden market and getting something that nobody else gets access to? And am I paying for something that's actually bullshit? And it happens. And that is a, very alarming. And I, I guess so, as I said, start me on this rant and I go off and on and on and on. <laughs> One of the other things I would say as well, um, put on your list, are you a member of Reba? Now, not every member of Reba is amazing, right? And not everyone who's not a member is not amazing. But 
the next question to ask is, did you go to the last conference? Because I have to say, and I was there, that generally speaking, there weren't many people at that conference that I thought I wouldn't feed, right? (laughs) So there weren't many people there that I wouldn't rate. Now, there are a few, but the vast majority of people that went to that conference I thought were ethical, really focus on their clients' best interests, really spend time and energy investing in their own skills and keeping up to date, and I think will do a fundamentally good job. I would say 95% of the people were there. So if you want to filter down, that'd be that'd be a really good filter. Are you a member of Reba? Did you go to the conference? So you can know then and then ask the other questions and you can make your mind up. I think you've got a fairly good chance. Excellent. Well, thank you for that. And, uh, you know, I, I actually think that in some cases doing it yourself is a good way to do it because you at least you get to know what's really mm. going on. But if you haven't got the time or in the wrong location, a buyer's agent, a good buyer's agent can take some of the heavy lifting off. But you've got to be careful. You've got to be picky and you've got to ask the right questions. Yep. All right. Here's another question. This is from Julie. Um, here's an interesting conundrum. Um, million pounds, which we want to put in the property. Investment property. Pounds. It's a million pounds. Coming in from us from the UK. From a year, right. <laughs> so presumably. So is that three million bucks now? I well, can't I don't know what's the exchange it, it, rate. It's, it's, I think it's 0.56. So, you know, it's, oh. it's, it's getting on the two, let's say two million Aussie, right? Right. Um, question is for an investment portfolio, when we're thinking sort of five to 10 years, she's saying we're confused about whether we should go for two or three apartments. Mm. or whether we should go for a house because of course you're going to have to pay a lot more for a house and you might but it's all in one place you could actually buy three apartments and you could spread the risk or you could buy three apartments in the same block and you know uh how would you go about unpicking (sighs) that problem if you were so you know you've got nothing to nothing to sell you've got this money in the bank and you're looking to build a investment portfolio it's actually in the sydney locale and is that their budget or have they gone and worked out whether they can also borrow some money? It's the money they've got. So I guess they, they, could, could, mor- they, could, they could borrow against it or mortgage it or, yeah. Yeah. And so obviously from a – so step one for me would be to get some financial advice yeah. in terms of, you know, A, your borrowing capacity, B, taxation implications, um, C, uh, the period of time over, you know, you want to – uh, what's your plan? I mean, why property? I guess is a, is a question as well to say, because to me, um, and obviously I'm not I'm not able to advise in any other um, category of investment other than property, but property is what we call a lumpy investment, right? And it is something that you buy, in my view, not so much for income, maybe in the future, you know, to provide income, but you, you're buying it for capital growth. It's the one asset that you can borrow, you can leverage to it to a great degree. You can, um, you know, you, you can, what else was I going to say there? I can't remember. Anyway, the point being that you get a woeful uh, yield on it. And if you're getting a really good yield, you're going to get a woeful capital growth. And why risk all of that money for woeful capital growth? right? You can diversify in other investment classes a hell of a lot better with good financial advice um, than you can in property. So therefore, if you're going to take the risk of putting all your eggs in one or two or three baskets, then you need to basically focus on capital growth. Otherwise, why bother? That, that That's the first thing. So when you're going to say, right, well, I want to go and find out my borrowing capacity, look at my long-term plan, Five years is not long enough. You really need to have at least a 10-year horizon, I believe, in order to properly invest in property. And then when you know exactly the size of the pool, and you might, when you get some financial advice, decide that you're going to invest some of that in property and the rest in shares or something else, right? Um, And then when you know what your what your allocation is to invest in property, it's then about working out, well, what's the best allocation of that, right? So if you came to me with $2 million in Sydney and said, right, I want to buy a house um, and that's it, right? 
one property, it's a house. Well, yes, we can find something for you that's going to be investment grade, um, you know, in, within the 10K radius. And I would say try to stay in as close to the, the CBD as possible, right, in, a, in this blue chip area as possible, right? If you said to me I had $1.5 million and I want to buy a house, I'd be like, ooh, we can, but you're going to get like a B or a C grade house and you could actually, for the same sort of money, buy a really good apartment, a cracker apartment. And I could show you examples last 10 years where a really shitty house has underperformed compared to the cracker apartment. So that's like that's one of the scenarios, right? If you had three million cash, you might go, well, I would put it in, I definitely would diversify. But I'd be looking at A grade property across the board. Would I buy a house and an apartment? Or how would I do that? And how would I diversify? And I'd have to have a conversation with my accountant about land tax obligations as well, because you think, okay, well, if I was going to diversify, would I do one in Melbourne? Would I do one in Sydney? If I was going to do an apartment, I'd be more inclined to do Sydney than I would anywhere else, to be quite frank, because apartments have not performed well um, elsewhere, really. Even good apartments haven't performed particularly well in, in Melbourne. We're still waiting for, I don't know, what to happen there. Um, whereas in Sydney, if you pick the IT out of it, you can do very well and really pick an A-grade asset with an apartment. And a lot of that's because of affordability or unaffordability. So that's a bit of a rant as well. Sorry about that. But hopefully that gives some clarity as to, you know, really the order in which you need to get some advice. Yeah, and... It wasn't a rant. I think that's a, you made some excellent points there because it is not straightforward. But I guess my observation is this. There's often the case of when you're thinking about the investment, you're not thinking about the ongoing running costs of maintaining the investment. Mm. And if you've got three small apartments, all of which are, are going to have to probably pay you know, ongoing fees just to keep the apartment running, right? Well... I'm going to hit you. Uh, look, I'm, I'm interrupting, I know. No, you carry on. Yeah. I'm guessing you're going to say that the ongoing costs of an apartment are going to be higher. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying we oh. should we should make sure that you do that part of the calculation as well. Yeah. So, so basically, you know, the, 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 the costs of the, the, the governing entity, the, the, the sinking fund for the repairs and all of those things, you have to incorporate those into, the, in, in, into your thinking. When you're buying an apartment, there's there's a whole extra layer of due diligence that needs yep. to be done. Absolutely. Now, the thing though, and and you know, I look at my own investments, the costs are roughly in percentage wise in terms of, of percentage of um, income are roughly the same, house and apartment. And that's because houses, all the maintenance is on you, mm. you know, whereas straddle areas is a budgeted form of you know maintaining and insuring that property and running that property. So and also typically yield on apartments is slightly better than yep. on houses as well. So it's sort of in terms of the percentages comes out in the wash. And I think if you're starting off with a big chunk of cash, particularly if you're a bit more mature and you know, you you don't want to sort of borrow heaps and have this huge dint in your cash flow. You want to enjoy life, right? Especially if you've got a nice big chunk of money there. You think I'll borrow enough so that I'm I'm ex uh, you know I'm having a higher exposure to the property market so that my investments um has got you know this my snowball's bigger, right? But I won't borrow so much that I have a cash flow problem, you know, you can do that. And that's why getting that financial advice at the beginning to sort of model those things out, it's really important. So you can determine, well, where am I comfortable? Mm. Where am I in my life? Where am, What are my goals? And and so therefore, how is this going to, to serve me in that? And the problem with property is that it's a great thing for really young people, but it's also a difficult thing for really young people because getting into the market is really tough. But if you can get into it when you're young with good assets, not shit assets, then you've got 20, 30, 40 years runway, then you start divesting as of property. But when you're getting closer to retirement age, you do need to have other assets in your pool. Maybe you've got a big super balance, but you do have to have other assets because the problem is that you get to, you know, you've had a property for 10 years, say, you know, and then you go to retire, you probably still got a chunk of debt on it. And, you know, and that's when you've got to start working out, well, how am I going to reduce the debt? What am I going to do? What's my plan there? So, and that's why it's really important to, to really work those things out before you commit to a property. Because once you are committed, you can't sell a bedroom to free up a bit of cash. That's very true. And I just want a quick point on the superannuation end of things. Um, there are, of course, limits on mm. superannuation when you actually move from the accumulation to the 
extraction phase, you know, that's 1.7 million, I think was the last time I looked, um, which basically means that anything above that, you can't actually use it. You've actually got to commute it. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of questions yeah. about the way that you've got your superannuation structured and the, and the value and the volume of that. So mm. you, you cannot make an investment Isolated decision decisions. on property <laughs> without having a canvas which includes mm. the other elements. I think that's that's sort of the key, the key first point. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, easy to say, tough to do, but it's really important to have a plan. <laughs> well, yeah, but the thing is that if you've got that much money, right, then you've got something to plan with. Yes, that's right. right. As opposed to early on in life when you're early on in your career, and, and this is a real problem because something like 50% of um, – financial planners left the industry in the wake of the Royal Commission when they increased the the uh, trade uh, the educational requirements for financial planners. A lot of a lot of experience left the industry. You can have your arguments as to whether they oh they're too lazy to get a degree or not. I don't know. There's experience left the industry. And so it's really difficult for people who don't have a significant amount of money now or a significant income now to get access to good financial advice. But if you've got a big pot of money like that, well, I would expect that financial planners probably going to be interested in talking to you. So you just got to find a good one of those and find someone who understands property and the, and will talk to you about property in the whole scheme of things because the problem is that they view that say it's not a financial pro- product I can't talk to you about it and then then you sort of cast adrift um and th- that's not the answer either and you I just made one of the points which I, was, which I was going to make there are very few financial planners in my view who puts property on the same tier as other market investments and actually yeah. have a holistic view which includes the property portfolio and you know the other investment classes the number of times I've, I've i've spoken with people in my one-on-ones where they've got really bad advice because they didn't include the the property bit of, in the story it was like mm. property's over there we'll just leave that we'll do the rest of it right it's, it's, so even their own home it's such an important part of our whole plan it's yeah, so ridiculous I know, I know. yeah it is. It's um, quite amazing, but there is the, that's another weakness in the in the uh, advice mm. uh, sphere in Australia. Well, yep. we're close to the end, but I just wanted to come back to Westpac again, uh, and I wanted to show you this. This is actually the Westpac um, report again, <clears throat> which came out today. Uh, I wanted to give you. They're saying New South Wales leading the way lower is their summary of New South Wales, right? Victoria, no let up in sight. Queensland, prices drop despite tight supply. Western Australia, still holding up well. South Australia, stalling but not falling. Tasmania, looking badly rattled. And the territories like NT slowing and the ACT prices are, are cracking. Uh, now, it's interesting when Westpac is, is at least trying to actually tease out some differences down at the state level, right? Which is what you and I have been saying for quite some time. You have to go granular the point i I guess i want to ask you is how granular is granular it's not granular enough they've got they've got northern territory and act on the same line for god's sake i mean what does that say that says to me throw the whole thing out (laughs) the act has been one of the big performers in recent times and northern territory i don't know i can't comment on that but i have to tell you well actually we'll comment i'll comment on the darwin apartment market Mm. because I do believe the last time I looked, the prices were still lower than they were 10 years ago. So whereas the, the ACT housing market went gangbusters and, in fact, I think did the median price pip Sydney at one point. At one point it did, yep. Yeah, yep. there you go. So yep. how could you have those two on the same line? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. And, and the reason for sort of putting it out there was that I get really frustrated with these sorts of reports, right? Because they sort of look all authoritative and they sort of, you know, say, well, you know, here's a page or two on New South Wales, here's a page on Victoria, right? As though somehow they've got the definitive a definitive view, right? And I can point to falls of property values. Look at my Auntie Spruce. For example, in in Western Australia and in South Australia, there are examples where property prices are being significantly cut right there are others where they're not but but you can't go at this high level view state level view you have to go really 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 local and then you have to look at the types of property the 
you know, the stars and the dogs and all of those things to really get a get a, a view. I I am of the belief that in the current environment, it's ever more critical to go local. Hmm. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. And because. <laughs> Even like if you look at say core logic data, they'll have Sydney and then rest of New South Wales. <laughs> yeah, like that's that's statistically <laughs> accepted, right? Rest Brisbane, rest, rest of me. Queensland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that means you're comparing Mackay and Southport. Yep. Um, very different markets. Or oh, Gimpy and I don't know, Dolby, Dolby, Texas. <laughs> There's a place called Texas in Queensland. Do you know that? Yeah. Um, so. It's it's ridiculous, and and you can't draw any conclusions from any of that. And the other thing too, I mean, I don't know. I haven't met the people in the, in Westpac's economics team. Maybe I maybe I should, but you know, we we have interviewed on the elephant in the room. We've interviewed uh, Felicity Emmett from ANZ, and we've also interviewed Belinda Allen from uh, ComBank, both senior economists. Really, in a view, in a in a quest to understand, you know, what they're looking at when they're coming out with their predictions and their 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 property market uh, commentary, and they are approaching it not from the market, right? So they're approaching it uh, at a macro level with lots lots of different inputs, and it's interesting stuff because this stuff does have an impact. But the problem is, it's the behavioural elements and on the ground. That's what makes the market do what the market does it's all reactions you know and so confidence i think westpac's confidence i could assume confidence um or the housing confidence index is quite useful because that's more about attitudes of people right and even at the moment all the confidence in, um, indexes uh, like consumer conf- confidence is way down and yet we can't rein in um, inflation because people are still spending money so we might not be confident but we're still spending Yep. So, so there's all these measures, but the actual behaviour—that's what we need to be looking at, because that's really what that's really what makes the market go up or down. Yeah, well, one of the things in my surveys is the financial confidence index series, which is trying to get those attitudinal points right. Because I actually think that's at the moment the most critical things. You know, it's, it's what people are thinking and what they're planning to do which then translates into some of my, my other modelling. But, uh, mm. yeah, you, you, can't macro, you can't do macroeconomics down on this stuff. That's the problem. It's, it's, it's the wrong way. You can bubble it up perhaps from the bottom. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know what I love, though? I mean, it, and I was reading about this only recently. It says the best forecasters will always adjust their forecasts. <laughs> and I'm like, so that just means that the best forecasters are just admitting that they're trying to, you know, make a call with imperfect information mm. and then they're constantly tweaking it as they get more information, mm. which basically means that their forecasts are shit because the minute they get more information, they're going to tweak it again. And so by the very process, which makes them good, is actually admitting that the process is a waste of time. Yes. RBA, please note. Because they're the worst of it, right? In terms of their oh, expectations, well. <laughs> and all those poor buggers that um, yes. you know that that took note of what Phil Lowe said about not raising rates till twenty twenty four, and let's face it, you know it sounds very credible, and the RBA comes out and says they're not going to do something, and people did act with confidence as a result of that. And you know, then he goes and retrospectively says, "No, I didn't really say that." Right? Well, sorry, Phil. At the time, I've got evidence. From real people that they took him at his word and made decisions based on what he said. Mm. So that's a very. I believed him. You know, I'm pretty cynical. I I I thought, God, he's. (laughs) (laughs) I thought if the RBA governor, the RBA says that, well, hey, you know. Yeah, indeed. You you know more than me, though. That's that's why you didn't believe him. (laughs) Well, I don't know about that, but uh, you know, I I, I mean, I go I go off the ASX um, thirty day forward implied right which is saying 3.7 percent um in april 2024 at the moment as a cash rate mm, interesting if that's anything like true then rates are not coming down anytime soon and that mm. means that we're going to be actually in for a long slow grind rather than a, a quick you know drop so it could be an uncomfortable ride which is why you've got to make important choices on more than just the financials why you've got to go granular and why um if you're going to 
pick people to help you, buyers, agents or whatever, make sure you pick them on the right basis rather than actually just because uh, I'm too busy, I'll get somebody else to do the work. No, no, you need yeah. to be a bit better than that. Um, we are, believe it or not, out of time. If people want to find out more about you and your services, where do they go? So many different places. Well, no, I've narrowed it down. I've got one now. They can go to veronicamorgan.com.au. That's simple. <laughs> Everything's there. I've updated it. I've upgraded it. So because I was just like, ah, oh, if you want this, you want that, blah, blah, blah. You can find everything I'm up to and uh, everything that I'm working on that really ultimately helps consumers get access to better advice so they can make better decisions, all points, all the directions point from that one website. And, and I reckon that uh, over the years, you know, the the, ex, the, the trajectory of, of, of our sort of thinking is continuing to sort of go like that because that's what I'm about too, trying to help people make better decisions, right? Because yeah. it's so critical, particularly in the current environment. So, well, thank you. I will update the uh, footnotes in the show so that people can just go there. I will just I'll share this, this with you because I did actually put a poll up. Um, New South Wales stamp duty allows some buyers to pay per year rather than at purchase. So is it a good move? 13% said good move. A bad move, 48%. 10% said it makes for little difference. And 29% said it's just political. And we got um, 163 votes on that. So there you go. That's a little bit from the audience. Uh, they're a little bit uh, sceptical of the uh, New South Wales move. So do they mean good move or bad move for buyers or for the government? Uh, the way I, I, I was thinking, looking at it from the point of view of the pe person buying, but maybe that's not how they answered it. So maybe it, I didn't ask the question clearly enough. <laughs> <laughs> sort of throw a spatter in the works. Well, who knows what will happen. There's an election in March, and if the Labor's, Labor gets in, yeah. I think they're making noise, they'll throw it out. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly right. We could be all, 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 um, all going again. Well, Veronica, I want to say thank you, son. I always enjoy speaking with you because you've always got such uh, potent and important views, very much, you know, around how people make better decisions so thank you very much for your time i will put the links and things below and uh, we should do it again sometime down the track uh, when uh, things will be different i don't know how but different they'll be different they'll be different but the same Indeed. thank you so much i really appreciate you inviting me on martin it's always lovely to chat to you and um you know it's hilarious that we're actually on the same page given that, <laughs> <laughs> that i get Accused of being a bear, bull every now and then, and you get accused of being a bear. It's quite I know, funny. <laughs> I know. Well, netted out, we're sort of somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good evening. I'll take you offline no and I'll, I'll close the show. See ya. My pleasure. Thank Bye. you. Well, there we go. I enjoyed that. I hope you did too. Uh, just to say that uh, next week um, we'll have uh, Damien Classen on. We're going to talk about the markets again. And, of course, uh, interesting month. The market's a bit stronger. The ASX was quite strong today. Um, and we might even talk about crypto and what's happening there as well so make your uh, make a note for that next week and uh, keep a track for the recorded shows during the week but uh, thank you very much for spending time with us uh, the dogs yep the dogs are still there so i'll give you one last look at the dogs uh, meteor is actually uh, looking at me thinking it's time for her evening walk so that'll be the next uh, job on my agenda tonight thank you very much for spending some time with us thanks for all the super chats and all the comments really appreciate it and uh, we will see you next week on the next live show this is marcy north from digital finance analytics signing off cheerio